so first of all, thanks everyone for uh, coming today to to this uh, lecture. This is the sixth uh, lecture in uh, the series on the Irish State and Revolution, uh, the book by uh, James O'Toole. Uh, today's session is on defying the state and about movements that have challenged the state. So. What we're going to do is we're, James is going to talk for about 20 minutes and then there'll be time for questions and answers and discussion uh, afterwards. And uh, people can put questions or comments in the chat uh, as we go along or uh, they can put their hands up uh, later on um, and chat. And just to let people know that this is being recorded for our YouTube series, uh, but we won't be recording the, um, the discussion afterwards. So, uh, James, if you want to start. Yeah, there were there were three times really that the uh, Irish state could have been challenged. There was the period of revolution and counter revolution from 1918 to 23, where the Irish state was being established and rich people like Kevin O'Higgins uh, established the Irish state. But there was also huge mass protests by working class people, you know, like the Limerick Soviet, there was mass strikes and protests, there was a couple of general strikes. It was the 1960s where you had, uh, the, by the end of the 1960s, you had a million and a half strike days lost in uh, uh, the 26 counties, but you also had the movement for civil rights, which exploded in the north uh, in the late 1960s, and both states were threatened, the stability of both states were threatened. Uh, and the other occasion that you'd think could have led to some kind of rebellion against capitalism, inequality, uh, and all the things we suffer under Irish capitalism, would really be after the bank bailout, after the uh, uh, bailout of 2008 and the austerity that followed. So I suppose what I want to focus on in this talk, because we've already spoken about uh, the, counter -revo the revolution and counter-revolutions in previous talks, is talk about why was it that the 2008 bank bailout and the immense level of suffering that was imposed on working class people why didn't it lead to uh, uh, to a rebellion? I think the first point to make is that crisis doesn't always initiate a rebellion automatically. That sometimes a crisis hits people over the head like a hammer and they feel demoralized, they feel confused. Uh, often people faced cuts alone. In other words, you're a lone parent and you face a cut to your income. You're nervous about providing for your kid or kids. You're nervous about losing your, losing your home. You're nervous about paying rent. You're nervous about all these things. And how are you going to connect what the state is doing to you and the fact that the state seems really powerful to you as an individual? How are you going to connect your anger at what's been done to you? To other lone parents, you don't automatically know if you're a lone parent in Clondalkin that there's a lone parent in an estate in Limerick who feels the same way and wants to actually take action. And so sometimes a crisis hits, we begin suffering because the ruling class use the state machine uh, to protect themselves, to bail out the banks and to make us pay. But then the suffering uh, causes uh, can cause momentary confusion. And so in the first stages of the, of the bailout, there was a lot of anger but there was a lot of confusion. And both things can happen at the same time. People can be furious at being a fall and at the same time be confused as to, you know, there was a load of arguments about why the bank bailout was happening, why it was necessary. Oh, the ATMs are going to freeze up. The entire media went on a, uh, a, an offensive to try and convince people that this was uh, necessary. And it was only really when austerity started to bite that people kind of you know, it was clarified to them what the bank bailout actually meant. You know, it wasn't just this abstract debate in the doll. The bank bailout was the money that was literally being taken out of your pocket, out of your income and out of, out of your life to, to bail out the uh, bankers. So the austerity causes uh, anger, it causes confusion and it causes questioning. People started to question uh, their 70-year uh, adherence to Fianna Fáil and Fianna Fáil collapsed in the polls. So people did begin to question things. The circumstances created uh, that questioning. Um, but I think what we have to say is that whenever there's a period where old certainties are questioned, there's a, there's a flux, there's a period of confusion. And that period of confusion doesn't automatically go in any given direction. I think in the last few years, we've seen how anger and confusion, for example, the fact that British workers wanted to kick back against the bureaucrats in Brussels and kick Westminster was actually articulated by right-wing Tories 
who captured that anger and stole it and uh, pulled it over to the right, rather than that anger being articulated by the Labour Party. The Labour Party uh, in Britain failed to articulate working class anger and were punished as a result. Uh, most recently, you could see the uh, results in Hartlepool where the Tories got in and Labour lost one of their heartlands. Um, and so not only do uh, does the right do the right wing parties, the government uh, and their media, you know, RTE often echoed the line of Fianna Fáil in terms of justifying the bank bailout. Not only did they try and intervene in the period of confusion to shape people's ideas, but also on our side in the working class, you've got uh, trade union leaders like Jack O'Connor, who's saying, Oh, don't be don't be confused. Don't protest. Don't 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 be so extreme. You know, we don't need to be like the Greeks. Let's negotiate with the government. You know, instead of uh, instead of fighting the government, they want to negotiate a deal. There's NGOs who are led by quite moderate people. There's you know, uh, um, there's loads of different political parties on the left who each had a different view as to what should have been done uh, to protest or to resist the bank bailout. And so, you have a a questioning of all certainties a period of anger and frustration and also of confusion amongst working class people. And then everybody from the right wing parties, the government and the media, down to the trade union leaders and the radical left, all jump in to try and shape the interpretation. And so if socialists do nothing except stand on the sidelines saying, you know, or maybe people will come our way because, you know, anger is rising or whatever. You could see that those other forces are going to be trying to pull things uh, in, in, their, in their direction. And I think that the, re the forced response to the uh, forced wave of austerity showed that protest was possible. Because when the trade union leaders called people out in 2009, if you, if you remember, there was a march of 100,000, 120,000 trade union members. But the problem was, although the ordinary working class people showed an enthusiasm for protest. They often left the leadership of the movement in the hands of people like Jack O'Connor. And Jack O'Connor from the stage said, vote Labour, that'll sort everything out. In other words, he used the 100,000 on the streets as almost like a stage army, you know, take you out of the box, bring you out on the streets, uh, march you around town and then put you back in a box and go do a deal with the government, which, which actually uh, uh, frustrates people because people want the movement to carry on. They want to go further. You know, they want to articulate uh, further demands on the government. But O'Connor and people like him in the union bureaucracy, who are also Labour Party members, uh, they wanted to guide the movement back into safe channels and negotiate with the system. And they did that. Uh, the Croke Park deal uh, was a deal uh, basically was negotiated austerity. They basically negotiated their surrender, but they said, you know, just make the austerity a little bit slower. And, you know, we'll make sure we keep the working class, uh, the organised working class, the, the unionised working class out of the fight. And so the Croke Park deal saw sip to and uh, impact the kind of more conservative uh, uh, unions in terms of their leadership, saw them take the, the, that, those sections of the working class uh, out of the fight to defend Labour going into coalition with Fine Gael and implementing another round of austerity. And so far from it being the case, that the huge anger and the huge confusion and the questioning of certainties that came about because of Fianna Fáil's implementation of austerity, far from that uh, inevitably tending towards the left, actually it was captured by the uh, Conservative Union leaders, the Labour Party, and that they focused that anger around getting Labour into government. And we saw what was called the Gilmore Gale. You know, uh, you know Gilmore was uh, hugely popular until people realised that you know, people like Joan Burton and even Ivana Bacic, who's standing in the by-election right now, were champions of austerity. They kicked lone parents and, and what Burton called the low-hanging fruit. You know, they went for the most vulnerable in society with their, their austerity. And then that creates another period of demoralisation and uncertainty. In other words, it's like a, 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 a spiral. In other words, the, the move, people are angry, they question things, they take a step forward, they're let down by Jack O'Connor and the Labour bureaucracy, they maybe fall one step back before they take two more steps forward. In other words, the process of people understanding the system and the process of understanding what we have to do to challenge the system uh, often progresses uh, uh, um, where you have people taking a step or two forward and a step back and then another step forward and then maybe one step back and then two steps forward. It never progresses in a, uh, an easy linear uh, fashion. And so um, 
the demoralization that came after Labour started to implement austerity when Labour went in with Fine Gael only started to really uh, uh, be overcome because the radical left, alongside of loads and loads and loads of ordinary people, got involved in the campaign against the household and water tax. I mean, it was the property tax and, uh, well, the household charge and then the property tax campaign that really, even though there was never really a protest above, you know, 15,000 people, it was never on the scale of the water movement. The campaign against the household charge and the property tax was important uh, on two levels. One, it started to overcome the demoralisation that was uh, sown because of Labour going into government and betraying people. Betrayal had left people deeply disappointed and demoralised. Um, but also, it started to, 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 to create uh, activist networks all over the country. And what you saw is a lot of the people who were protesting against the household charge and then the property tax were the same people who launched uh, right to water groups or, or, or uh, 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 you know, launched water campaigns in the area when the water movement did come along. So that activist network was really important in the years uh, in the years to come in terms of what it would do to help mobilise communities. And I think that. In saying that, you know, SIP2 an impact on the right wing of the uh, union movement helped to try and limit anger after the bank bailout, uh, all in the name of getting Labour into government, but then getting Labour into government, they promised would end austerity. But all it did was bring about a negotiated uh, slower version of austerity, although they claimed they were uh, slowing it down or ameliorating it. But there was no evidence that Labour really stood up to Fine Gael, uh, when they were in government. Um, so working class people were made to suffer. But Mandate and Unite trade unions, Mandate and Unite are uh, more on the left of the union uh, leaderships. They often employ a more left wing rhetoric. They, you know, they talk more left. But actually, when it comes down to it, when the bigger battalions of the union movement like SIP to our impact sign up to a deal like Croke Park, often you'll find that the unions that talk left go along with the deal in the end. They put up a little bit of verbal kind of opposition, but then they go, oh, we've no choice. We have to, you know, we have to sign the deal because everybody else has signed the deal. And I suppose if you go on the, you know, if you went on the Debenhams picket lines and talked to rank and file workers, grassroots workers who were involved in pickets, you know, uh, when you're actually involved in the strike, the kind of uh, being chained to legalism and the fear of defying the Industrial Relations Act that chains the bigger unions also chains the smaller unions. And they sometimes don't do what's necessary to do in order to win a strike like the Debenhams dispute. And they often leave workers demoralised and frustrated and angry. So they're a little bit better than the uh, bigger, more conservative unions. But at the same time, they engage in a lot of left rhetoric, but then sometimes they don't deliver on that rhetoric, which can, which can often frustrate uh, grassroots workers. But I think when the government moved to uh, implement water charges, that really started to focus people's anger. It wasn't just uh, anger against the charge. The charge was something that was, you know, it was easy to generalise because it affected everybody and it brought everybody together. But the anger was the anger that had accumulated from the previous five or six years. You know, people were angry about everything. They were angry about every single cut that they'd suffered. They were angry against the bank bailout. They were angry about Labour's betrayal and the fact that Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael and Labour had all lined up to make ordinary people pay uh, for the pay for the crisis. And so the water movement was kind of the coming together of a movement from below and a movement uh, kind of from the top uh, in terms of a coalition of parties and groups. The movement from below began because there was a series of grassroots street meetings uh, in April 2014. I remember myself uh, and uh, Madeleine Johansson, Jean O'Kenny worked with some local residents uh, in Clondalkin, a woman called Georgina O'Halloran and her son Dominic O'Halloran. We did up a leaflet to call a street meeting uh, to dip our toes in the water and see how people would respond to meeting on their own uh, green rather than you know, a formal meeting in a, in a hall and stuff like that. Uh, but the street meeting was usually successful. 50 people came out and they all wanted to resist water charges. But everybody kept asking at these street meetings, when are we going to have a big demo? When are we all going to come together and have a big demo? Um, and so at the same time, People Before Profit had actually called a Right to Water uh, conference in April 2014. And that brought together the left wing of the union movement, Unite and Mandate came and spoke, uh, uh, and some people from the left, and a speaker from Pochabamba in Bolivia, where they had a mass movement that resisted water charges. 
And so that conference led to a subsequent meeting in the Dáil where Richard Boy Barrett from People Before Profit met with representatives from Unite, Mandate and Sinn Féin and they formed the Right to Water Coalition. So you had this flowering of resistance from below. You had resistance to water meters spreading throughout the summer. And then you had this coalition which called the October the 11th uh, Right to Water, the first protest, which gave people a focus because, you know, people wanted to come together in large numbers. And actually, the first march of 120,000 people hugely lifted people's confidence. People were grinning from ear to ear on that march as they saw the sheer amount of numbers of other working class people on the streets. And I think that that's important to say that the first step in turning people towards socialism or getting people to understand that we have to challenge this rotten state that we live under, this corrupt state needs to be replaced. The fourth step is bringing them together in those kind of numbers. If you bring 120,000 people onto the streets, uh, it takes people out of their isolation and they don't feel that they're confronting the state as an isolated individual, as an isolated lone parent, as an isolated person who's lost their job, because as an isolated individual, those things seem overwhelming. When you're standing with 120,000 other people who, who are in the same kind of situation you're in, you feel an immense strength and an immense power. But I have a quote here uh, by uh, a socialist writer called Chris Harmon. And he says, and, uh, and people that had been through the water protests will, will, will identify with this. He said, there are two phases to every social movement. He said, the first phase is one of sheer joy. And I think anyone that was on those four year water marches will understand that. The sheer joy at seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of other people in the same boat as you out on the streets defying the government. So there's a sheer sense of joy. But the problem is that people are quite naive when they're new to protest. They think that the momentum and the sheer energy and positivity of the movement will by itself uh, overthrow the state and you know overturn uh, water charges and maybe even go further and you know lead to a, a reconfiguration of society or people think that actually the job is going to be easily done because they've been isolated their whole life and then they suddenly join in a movement and they're standing there with tens of thousands of other people so people are overwhelmed with a kind of a joy and a positivity which is a good thing but tends to make people think that the task is going to be easy so then that's the first phase of most social movements. The second phase is where, you know, in Star Wars terminology, you'd say the empire strikes back. In other words, where the state goes, hang on a minute, we're not backing down. In other words, the state starts battening people who are protesting uh, for on water meters and stuff like that. You know, the state starts to uh, uh, act to oppress the movement. The media starts to put propaganda out that undermines the movement, that says why well, you have to pay the charge and stuff like that. And, and so there's, uh, the battle becomes more intense. And, and, and at that stage, you have a choice. You see, some of the reformists uh, who have taken a part in the, lead, in the movement and have been positive in terms of building the movement. In other words, working with people like Mandate or Unite or working in the United Front with soft or left parties is good for socialists because actually it brings more work class people on the streets and then there's more people to talk to about the issues raised by the social movement. But the problem is when the state strikes back, when you reach that second phase of every social movement where questions about tactics and strategy arise and you have to have actually really in-depth discussions about where to go next. When that happens, if the movement hasn't been transferred in terms of its power, if the power of the movement hasn't been taken by the grassroots through democratic assemblies, through democratic meetings, through open forums, then often the, the leaders who played a positive role at the beginning of the movement act on a, as a break on the movement uh, in the subsequent uh, the subsequent uh, phase of the movement. And so you can you can see that not only in terms of the first phase of austerity, where uh, people start to question the old certainties, the questioning of old certainties raises questions, but it's up to socialists to intervene to help people answer those questions. In other words, when people see Fianna Fáil uh, implementing uh, austerity after voting for them for 70 years, a socialist can use the fact that someone has experienced betrayal by Fianna Fáil to say, well, Fianna Fáil are a right wing party. They represent a section of the capitalist class. They've always represented the elite. And on the basis of having experienced Fianna Fáil betray them, people will understand what you're saying. If someone gets battened by a policeman, you know, uh, protesting against water meters, that raises questions about the nature of the police. But it doesn't automatically answer the question. 
That's the point. Struggle is really important in terms of raising these questions, but you need uh, working class people who are already socialists to articulate what's often on the tip of people's tongues. In other words, they've experienced the police resisting what they think is their legitimate movement to, to get rid of water charges, and they're questioning why the local policeman would be pushing them uh, off a water meter in front of their house. But on the basis of that experience, if a working class person who's already a socialist say the police are acting like that because they're a caste who act in the service of the bosses, they always act in the service of the golden circle. The police aren't workers, they're uh, the enemies of workers, they oppress workers. That person, uh, the combination of the experience they've just had and the articulation of an, you know, an explanation of that experience by someone who's already a socialist, the combination of both will lead to the creation of a new layer of working class people who understand that our social movements have to end in challenging, uh, challenging the state. And I suppose the last thing I want to say uh, really is that lately uh, there's been a big debate on Twitter and social media because when the Palestine ha protests happened a couple of weeks ago, uh, groups like People Before Profit, uh, socialist groups went out and leafleted these protests. But if what I've said is true, that every social movement uh, faces an intervention by the government, an intervention by the media, an intervention by trade union leaders who want to negotiate it back into the uh, safe channels acceptable to the system, intervention by liberals, intervention by anarchists, individuals, but intervention by NGOs. If you think about it, if socialists don't articulate their ideas, if socialists don't hand out their leaflets, if socialists don't try to express uh, and make clear what people are experiencing and why they're experiencing it, somebody else will win the argument. And if somebody else wins the argument, the movement will be damaged. The movement will uh, not succeed because the movement will be weakened. Whereas socialist ideas, like for example, that the grassroots of the movement should be empowered by having big democratic assemblies where everybody's involved in the decision-making, those kind of socialist ideas empower a movement, but you have to fight for your ideas. And so that's the last thing I'll say is say that struggle is always the first step in empowering people and creating a new layer of socialists who understand that we need to fight and challenge the golden circle. But struggle by itself doesn't answer the questions raised by struggle. People who've been through past struggles, people who are already uh, socialists, working class people who have already experienced the nature of the Irish state, need to intervene in those struggles, need to have the moral authority that comes from being involved in those struggles to articulate and point out what's on the tip of everybody's tongue uh, and to clarify uh, a way forward for the movement and to connect each social movement to the necessity of replacing the rotten state that we live under with a state that serves the interests of working class people. So I'll open up there for discussion. Thanks uh, very much, James. That's uh, really good. And um, just to let people know, I didn't say it at the start that this uh, is being organised by uh, Rebel Telly and the uh, Red Network of People Before Profit. And if anyone is interested in getting involved, uh, they can um, find our website, rednetwork.ie. Uh, and uh, we're also selling uh, James's book, The Irish State and Revolution, on the website. So feel free to uh, have a look. So now uh, we're going to open up to uh, questions uh, and answers and 